for today's topic, what I'd like to talk to you about is not only the, the role of the entrepreneur, but more specifically, what I want to talk about is the role of the entrepreneur in the market process. So that's what we're going to be primarily talking about today. And in order to do so, what I want to do is situate our discussion of entrepreneurship within a particular case study. Now, just by a show of hands before we begin, I just want to ask uh, the, all of you, just by a show of hands, how many of you have heard the name Jeff Bezos? Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates. How about Malcolm McLean? Anybody? Nobody. He's probably the most important entrepreneur of the 20th century. If we could trace one individual that is most directly responsible for the reintegration of the world economy after World War II, it would probably be this individual. But the purpose of my talk for today is not primarily to talk about entrepreneurial thinking per se, although that is important, but what I want to get you to think about is that element of human action that is essential, that element of human action that is essential to the peaceful and productive coordination of resources in a market economy. In other words, if the fundamental question that drives economics is to realize how can we realize social cooperation and productive specialization under command. The question is, how is the knowledge generated? How is the knowledge generated by which individuals are able to cooperate in such a manner that resources tend to become efficiently allocated? Okay. So, to begin, I want to begin with the following quote from, or paraphrase I should say, the following quote from the great Austrian economist, Israel Kirzner. Israel Kirzner, as his doctoral dissertation under Ludwig von Mises, published a book called The Economic Point of View. He, he, he defended the dissertation in 1957 and in 1960, uh, published it as the economic point of view. And that book is, you might say, a book not only in his economic theory, but a book in the history of economic thought. And what Kersner says there is that he talks about economics uh, being a march or the progression of economic science, progressing from a science of wealth to a science of human action. A science of wealth to a science of human action. So if the question that, that we are trying to understand is why is it certain countries or societies are relatively rich and some countries and societies are relatively poor, what we first have to understand is not only that element of human action that coordinates resources in a peaceful and productive manner, but we also have to understand how entrepreneurship can be redirected into un, potentially unproductive ways, into potentially unproductive ways. So to begin, what I want to do is a brief review. In order to understand the role of the entrepreneur in economics, we have to first understand the factors of production that help us to understand production processes in any economic system. So what are some factors of production? Labor is a factor of production. Land is a factor of production. Capital 
is a form of production. Now let's just define these very, very briefly. When we talk about labor and land, these are oftentimes ref called, referred to by economists as the original factors of production. They're original factors of production because they're given to us by nature. And capital is a produced means of production that is an aid, uh, is an aid to increase human productivity. It's an aid to increase human productivity. Now, from a physical standpoint, labor and land are given to us by nature. Capital, you might say, is given to us by human labor, human effort, right? But from an economic standpoint, what breathes life into these factors of production, what gives them economic value, is the role of the entrepreneur in catalyzing or coordinating production. Now, I've, I've used the word entrepreneur several times, but we haven't quite defined what an entrepreneur is. And we talked a little bit about, I gave some examples by a show of hands, asking you who some entrepreneurs are. But when we're talking about an entrepreneur, we're not talking per se about a particular class of individuals. We're not necessarily talking about a specific aspect of human behavior that is exclusive to a special hand-picked group of individuals. When we're talking about entrepreneurship, we're talking about that element of human action that every individual exercises when they make a choice. Choice under uncertainty is an entrepreneurial act. Choice under uncertainty is an entrepreneurial act. What do I mean by that? In order to understand what I mean by that, we have to go back to the fundamental basis of economic science, which is the role of scarcity. What do we mean by scarcity? All right, what is the definition of scarcity? What we mean by scarcity is the fact that the number of ends that individuals wish to pursue exceed the available resources or means to achieve those ends. How many ends or goals do individuals have? They're unlimited. The means are, are scarce to achieve all those ends, but are they given? No. In other words, in order to understand the role of the entrepreneur, we have to make a distinction between an economic problem and a technical problem. An economic problem and a technical problem. Has anyone here seen the movie Apollo 13 with Tom Hanks? I may be dating myself now, showing how old I am when I say this. Well, if you go to the movie, that's a, this, this is a homework assignment. In fact, you can go to YouTube and look at the clip. There's a clip in which there's a group of engineers and they're trying to assemble a filter. The reason why they're trying to assemble a filter is because in Apollo 13, the astronauts are utilizing the spacecraft to land on the moon, which is only designed for two people. They're using it as a lifeboat, you might say. So they're saturating the air with carbon dioxide and they're suffocating themselves. So the engineers have to engage in an activity to solve this problem. Now, is this a technical problem or an economic problem? Well, what happens is they throw all of the available resources on the table and they say, 
look, we have to figure out how to make this, this is the filter, and fit it into the hole for this. They have to make a square filter that fits into a round hole using the available resources to them. Is that a technical problem or an economic problem? Why? That, that's correct. Because they have money or they have resources where they can feed uh, those filters. For a single end, correct? So what's, what do we have here? We have a situation in which there's a defined end and there's a defined set of means, correct? So it's a matter of using scientific knowledge to search for that solution. I'm gonna to return to this in a moment. To search for that solution, okay? You have a given end and given means. But the nature of the economic problem is not to satisfy one end, but to allocate, not simply allocate, but to discover the means, the most appropriate means, the most effective means amongst competing and yet undiscovered ends. So in order to understand the role of the entrepreneur in addressing or solving econ economic problems, what we have to understand is a distinction between search and discovery. Now, what do we mean by search versus discovery? What search refers to is the deliberate effort. It's the deliberate effort to eliminate a known unknown. It's the deliberate effort to eliminate a known unknown. Let me give an example to illustrate this point about search. In ancient times, when I was your age, when we didn't have cell phones and we needed to find the phone number, we would actually go to the yellow pages. This is in the US. Now, here too, okay. Now, why is this a known unknown? For example, I, let's su suppose I wanna call my best friend. I don't know my best friend's name. I don't know his phone number, but I'm aware of my ignorance. Therefore, I take deliberate effort to eliminate, you might say, that ignorance. It's a known unknown. I don't know my friend's phone number, but I'm aware that I'm unaware. And therefore, because of that ignorance, I, make deliberate, I take deliberate effort, I utilize resources, I incur a cost to gather that information, to gather that information, okay? So it's an, that's a known unknown. The role of discovery in entrepreneurial process is guided by alertness to unknown unknowns. Now, to illustrate this point, let me give an example. Let me give an example to illustrate this point between a known unknown and alertness to an unknown unknown. I was very, very fortunate at a young age to meet the love of my life, who became my wife. We've been married 14 years now, my wife Andrea. Now, the circumstances in which I met her were one in which I was simply going to a seminar in economics. My purpose 
was simply to go and learn about economics, okay? Now, in the process of going there, I was surprised by something I was completely unaware of. I was alert to an opportunity, you might say, to meet the love of my life. But note, what's the difference here? When you're searching for something, you're making a deliberate effort to achieve an outcome. When you discover something, it's like a $100 bill on the sidewalk that's sitting right in front of your face, readily made available to you. Right? There's the old expression, right, that uh, some people are lucky. Well, from an entrepreneurial perspective, you have to make your own luck. The, the entrepreneur is not simply a lucky. They discover that they are in a lucky situation, right? So we are in, I was put in a situation, you might say, that was purely by accident for a completely different purpose. In the process, I discovered an unknown unknown, which was the end, it was to pursue a relationship with my future wife. Now, in order to understand this, in order to understand this, I'm not suggesting that these are mutually exclusive. For example, once I discovered her, what do you think was the next thing I did? I searched for the best ways for us to be together. But without the element of discovery, right, without the element of discovery, what would that imply? it would imply that when I arrived at the age of reason, I already knew who the love of my life was and I would take action and resources to go and find her. I knew that she was the love of my life, Andrea. But that's not how human behavior unfolds. Human behavior is, is, operates under a world of uncertainty in which through our alertness to proffered opportunities, we expose errors. We expose errors. The fact that I discovered it, that opportunity, it exposed an, a, an error. I was going there for, the, for, the completely, for a completely wrong reason. Okay? This is going to be important. What I'm talking about is the entrepreneur isolated from the market context. But this point about alertness, surprise, and the exposure of error is what makes the market process a procedure for learning, discovery, and error correction. Learning, discovery, and error correction. Without this element of discovery, then human behavior can simply be collapsed into an act of maximization where you have given means and you have given ends. You don't need to make a choice in the same way that animals respond to their instinct and stimuli. But the nature of, of human choice in which, is one in which individuals discover ends and discover the most appropriate means to achieve those ends. Okay. What this also implies is the following. It also implies the following. When we're talking about search, and a known unknown, what that implies is we can price an outcome within a probability distribution. For example, insurance companies have actuarians. And what do they do as actuarians? They're calculating, they're computing the amount of risk given a, a pool of, of individuals for car accidents, for death, for f damage to their home, and so on and so forth. Given that pool, they can calculate with a degree of probability the risk to assign and the price that an individual has to pay in terms of an insurance premium. However, if all human activity could be distilled into search, that would imply 
no profits and no losses. Let me give an example to illustrate this point. I'm sure many of you have heard of the name Warren Buffett before. How many of you are familiar with his famous and correct bet on Coca-Cola? Right? He bought, right, what happened was uh, both Buffett and Munger began to buy large blocks of shares in Coca-Cola between 1988 and 1989. Now, for those of you who are, have studied financial economics or are studying financial economics, right? If a stock is at a PE ratio of 30, 30 times earnings, it's generally expensive, right? But if all the information in the market is already baked into or priced into assets, there are no profit opportunities. But what Munger and Buffett were able to realize is that in the long run, this stock was actually much cheaper than what was being priced. They were able to utilize their judgment and therefore were able to buy shares of Coca-Cola at a low price with the expectation of being able to sell them at a high price. Now, it's not as if that they, the, the information wasn't already available to them. Anyone, if, if, if it was simply a matter of simply calculating the balance sheet, the PE ratios, the cash flows of Coca-Cola, then any one of you could simply pay someone to do the calculation for you and you return a profit, right? But entrepreneurship is not just based on search. It's based upon this discovery, not only of the fact that resources are currently undervalued to their possible uses or ends, but also the ability to purchase those resources at a low price and resell them at a high price. Okay. Let me, now that I've introduced what I mean by entrepreneurship, I am now going to situate the role of the entrepreneur in the market process. Now, there are two ways in which we can understand the role of the entrepreneur in the market process. Fundamentally, we could divide up these processes which are distinct but related and complementary as Kersnerian entrepreneurship and Schumpeterian entrepreneurship. Schumpeterian entrepreneurship. Now, Israel Kersner was a student of Ludwig von Mises at New York University. And one of his most fundamental contributions to our understanding of the entrepreneurial market process is the role in which the entrepreneur plays an equilibrating tendency in the market process. So for the Kersnerian entrepreneur, the analytic point of departure, the starting point of analysis, is a world of disequilibrium. It's a world of disequilibrium. What do we mean by, if, if we live in a world of disequilibrium, what does that imply? What does that imply? 
It implies, first and foremost, what economists refer to is an efficient, inefficient allocation of resources. Meaning that there are gains from trade that can be exploited or realized by reallocating resources to more valued uses. And in doing so, the entrepreneur generates through the lore of profit and the discipline of loss, a tendency towards equilibrium, right? A tendency towards equilibrium. But the entrepreneur acting by him or herself does not realize this outcome. That is this equilibrating tendency emerges by virtue of the fact that entrepreneurs are competing against each other to realize profits. And in the process of realizing profits, they also expose errors in the entrepreneurial market, in, in the decision making. And in turn, those errors feed the potential for future profit opportunities. So in effect, there is a continuous process of error correction, learning, and discovery. There's a continuous process of error correction, learning, and discovery. But there's a continuous tendency towards equilibrium, governed by the law of one price, or as Kersner refers to it, Jevons' law of indifference. That is, taking disequilibrium as our analytic point of departure, the way in which the entrepreneur realizes profit opportunities is through acts of arbitrage. Acts of arbitrage. So let's say, for example, we have a market for oranges. And oranges are being sold at a relatively low price in Guatemala City. But they're being sold at a relatively higher price in Antigua. The fact that there is this difference in prices sets up a profit opportunity for an entrepreneur to buy oranges at a low price and resell them in Antigua where they can capture a higher price. What is the tendency? Is that there's a tendency for prices to equilibrate across markets. What this illustrates is that the nature of the entrepreneurial market process is one in which sellers are competing against sellers and buyers are competing against buyers. But buyers and sellers cooperate to realize mutually beneficial exchanges. Right, so what is happening through entrepreneurs realizing this profit opportunity? They, are, they realize what they're, what they're aware of is the fact that oranges are being sold at a higher price implies or could be sold at a higher price, is that there's an error in the, in the current allocation of resources. Consumers who would otherwise not purchase oranges at a lower price would now drop out of the market. So as the price of oranges tends to get bid up in Guatemala City, what happens? Consumers drop out of the market they consume less oranges. And what happens in Antigua? The price gets bid down. This is, all base, this is all very basic, but this is going to become very important in distinguishing it from the Schumpeterian entrepreneur. 
Now, what we refer to as Schumpeterian entrepreneurship can be traced back not only to Schumpeter's great work on economic development, his 1911 book, but also his 1942 book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, where he refers to the capitalist process as one of creative destruction. How many here have heard of this term before? Creative destruction. Okay. This term, creative destruction, you might say is quite appropriate. Why is it appropriate? Because for Schumpeter, what he did in analyzing the role of the entrepreneur was to take as his analytic point of departure was a world of equilibrium, one in which all the gains from trade have been exhausted and there are no profit opportunities to be had. Okay, But if there are no profit opportunities to be had, then where does the role of the entrepreneur come from? Where does the role of the entrepreneur come from? It is from disrupting that, disequil that equilibrium, excuse me. So the role of the Schumpeterian entrepreneur in this process of creative destruction is to di disrupt a prevailing status quo defined by equilibrium, where all the gains of trade are you might say, exhausted. Where profit opportunities come from is that they are created through technological innovation. So if our analytic point of departure is equilibrium, the entrepreneur realizes profit opportunities by creating them through technological innovation. Now, what I have outlined here seem to be two different and mutually exclusive ways of thinking about the role of the entrepreneur and entrepreneurial thinking in the market process. But what I want to illustrate to all of you, utilizing the case of Malcolm McLean in containerization, is that in fact, these two processes are flip sides of the same coin. They're flip sides of the same coin. What I mean by that is that we could unify both the Kersnerian and the Schumpeterian entrepreneur into one process of creative arbitrage. Creative arbitrage. The role of the entrepreneur is to realize or create goods and services that human beings value, but they're created, you might say, ex nihilo, out of nothing, by redeploying resources where they're less valued and deploying them towards resources and the productions of goods or services that are more valued to human beings, okay? Now, in order to illustrate this, let me talk a little bit about Malcolm McLean. Now, the, the story of Malcolm McLean 
is very, very interesting. And it's quite illustrative of what I'm trying to illustrate here in, in the role of the entrepreneur in the market process. And the reason why this is such a powerful example, because it illustrates how, entre how important entrepreneur is, how important entrepreneurship is. The role of the entrepreneur is so important and we realize the importance of the role of the entrepreneur when in fact goods and services that we take for granted as common had to be realized by someone. It didn't just spring out of thin air. Now what do I mean by that? McLean began his career as a North Carolina truck driver. He was not a shipping merchant at all. Now, as a North Carolina truck driver, what he realized was the fact that it took roughly the same amount of time for goods and service, for goods, excuse me, to be shipped across the Atlantic, roughly a 10 day voyage. It took the same amount of time for dock workers, longshoremen, to offload that cargo and then redeploy it on the back of a truck. Now, that is a profit opportunity that he discovered that he was alert to. It wasn't simply a matter of search. If it were a matter of search, well, he didn't invent trucks, he didn't invent cranes, he didn't invent ships, he didn't even invent containers. If you go back to the Phoenicians, the idea of putting boxes on ships can be found all the way back to their history. So one might say, what was his technological innovation? What was his technological innovation? If he didn't invent trucks, trains, planes, or any of these things, if these were given, what he was able to discover, what he was aware of, that was a profit opportunity that was literally staring in front of everyone's face. The container could have been discovered decades ago because the available technology was there. But what made him unique is that he had a vision. The nature of entrepreneurial thinking is to have a creative vision, to recombine resources in a manner that otherwise people would not have other, otherwise could imagined. Yes, ships in, were existed, containers existed, trucks had existed, Cranes existed, but did containerization exist as an idea? Not before McLean. I talked about from the very beginning, land, labor, and capital being the factors of production. But their economic value is only realized through the entrepreneur discovering ways to recombine resources. So McLean's vision, you might say, was a technological innovation, right? But how did he realize this technological innovation? He realized it because the inventors of containers, individuals who built ships, and individuals who made cranes or trucks, they could have realized this technology, technological innovation. It was readily available to them. But the way he was able to realize it was buying resources at a low price and reselling them at a high price. For example, one of the things that McLean was able to do was to buy what was regarded 
as leftover ships from World War II, Liberty ships, and then refit them as container ships. Now, from the standpoint of the builders of those Liberty ships, what they regarded as a waste was an error on their part. That was an error because what McLean exposed, what he discovered, is something that they were not aware of, that they, those resources could have been reallocated to a more valued use, right? To a more valued use. So in effect, did the container ship, even those, those physical resources existed, physically, from an economic standpoint, they did not exist until McLean, you might say, breathed life into those resources by recombining them in such a way so that planes, excuse me, trucks, cranes, and ships could all be recombined into one single form of intermodal transport. One single form of intermodal transport. So this, you might say, there was a prevailing equilibrium. There were no profit opportunities to be had given the prevailing status quo. But McLean was able to realize this technological innovation by arbitra arbitraging resources from a less valued use to a more valued use. With the voyage of the first container ship, I believe it was April 26th, 1956. It was called the Ideal X. It shipped from Newark to Houston. Now, why is this so important? Because of McLean's innovation, the cost of, and these are estimates that economists have tried to calculate, the cost of, of shipping goods and services today is 1 16th of what it cost in 1956. Just think about that, 1 16th. Just the other day, I bought flowers for my wife. They came from Peru. That wouldn't have been possible without the container ship. The ability to have refrigerated container ships shipping to me before the flowers spoiled from one place to another. And by reducing the cost of transportation, what McLean was able to discover was a way in which to realize the gains from trade, to realize the gains from trade. But what other costs were reduced? It's because McLean was able to rediscover a way to define property rights. For shippers, time is literally money. Every minute that a ship is in dock is one less minute it could be shipping cargo back and forth. Moreover, when longshoremen, dock workers, would offload and unload cargo, there were potential costs associated with theft, breaking goods and services, goods perishing because eggs can only stay on a dock for so long, right? All these costs were reduced. This wealth was created simply by recombining resources and discovering a way to recombine these resources. Why is this so important for understanding, you might say, the wealth and poverty of nations today? Anybody here taking biology or has taken a course in, in biology? No? If you go to any species on Earth, there are in effect four proteins, four amino acids that constitute the double helix of DNA in every species on Earth. Adenine, guanine, thi thymine, cytosine. Don't ask me how I remember that. It's just something I remembered from my high school biology class, something that always fascinated me. But just think about that. There are millions of species on Earth. What makes them different? Simply different recombinations of those four building blocks of DNA. 
Now, what's the economic counterpart? Land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Simply by the continuous reshuffling and recombining resources in such a way to eliminate waste, the potential for economic growth is unlimited. It's literally unlimited. It's undefined because all those combinations have not yet been discovered. If it were a simply, if it were simply a matter of search, science would be able to calculate to us the endpoint of economic growth. But given the fact that these combinations are dependent upon human valuations, which are constantly changing, and that these valuations are subjective in people's minds, that knowledge needs to be discovered. And that knowledge is created through entrepreneurs competing against each other. And the nature of that knowledge is such that no entrepreneur acting independently of each other can become aware of it. What do I mean by that? Think about the process by which we've arrived at the computers that usually sit on your desks today. Okay? Think about the, desks, the, the computers that sit on your desk today. By the way, do you know, does anyone know where the term computer comes from or who were the first computers? These were actually women in the United States who because of so many men being drafted into the armed forces during World War II, there were people that needed to be trained in mathematics to calculate the ballistics of artillery. So that, for example, when soldiers had to make calls for artillery, they needed to know where the, what do you say, the shells landed. They needed exact mathematical calculations. Who computed them? Human beings, women sitting down, calculating them, these mathematicians. It's a great movie on this that you should go see called Hidden Figures about NASA and, and trying to put a, a human being in orbit. You had to calculate how to bring them back. They were calculated by human beings. That's where the computer comes from. But the first modern computer, which is known today, which was built in the 40s, the ENIAC, what did that give rise to? Well, it gave rise to, you might say, the microprocessor or excuse me, the use of transistors. But without the ENIAC, there would not have been a market for the discovery of semiconductors. Right? Gordon Moore, famous entrepreneur, founder of Intel. And what did the creation of semiconductors do? it set up a profit opportunity for personal computing, right? Give, the technology was, existed, but Gordon Moore didn't exactly realize it. Some, someone else had to. This is what I mean by the entrepreneurial process being one in which entrepreneurs discovering profit opportunities expose previously existing errors in the allocation of resources. So the semiconductor gave rise to the computer a personal computer. What did the personal computer then give rise to? The mouse. Right? Without the personal computer, there wouldn't have been a mouse. Or let me, let, me, I'll, I'll, let me give other examples of other processes. Think about the discovery of kerosene. Why did Rockefeller become a discoverer of kerosene? Because there was a profit opportunity to be realized due to the overhunting of whales the way that people heated their homes or, or lit their homes was through whale oil. But as a, as a byproduct, as an accident, what was discovered by Rockefeller drilling for kerosene, gasoline, right? Rockefeller was, was not trying to discover gasoline. Gasoline is a byproduct of kerosene itself. But then, gasoline 
created what? A profit opportunity for what? The internal combustion engine, which then created the profit opportunity for automobiles, okay? So this is what the entrepreneurial market process is all about. It sets up the conditions for discovery, learning, and error correction by the continuous recombination and reshuffling of resources according to the most valued consumer uses of these resources. But all of this is dependent upon a system of private property rights, one in which entrepreneurs bear the benefits as well as the costs of their decision making. However, although entrepreneurship is necessary for economic process, as I've just talked about, and entrepreneurs exist always and everywhere, given what I've talked about Kersner and, and the point that I made that the element of the entrepreneurial element of human action is, exists among, amongst all individuals, right? So if all individuals have this capacity to be entrepreneurial, why are some countries relatively richer compared to countries that are relatively poor? Can it be explained by a scarcity of entrepreneurs? No. There is no society that is scarce in entrepreneurship. There is no society, the relative wealth or the relative poverty of which can be necessarily explained by different supplies of entrepreneurship. Rather, what it's explained by are the rules of the game. The rules of the game. The degree to which the institutional arrangements of a society either encourage or discourage productive entrepreneurship or unproductive entrepreneurship, okay? More importantly, many of the most important entrepreneurial discoveries that have explained modern economic growth have come from technological innovations which were used for one use were then transferred or transmitted for other practical purposes. Let me give an example to illustrate this point. In, I've already given one example in economic history, which is containerization. But just think about something as basic and mundane as double entry bookkeeping, right? Making a balance sheet. Firms today, they, 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 they make balance sheets, right? In order to calculate their profits and losses. Does anybody where, know where double entry bookkeeping came from or where it comes from? It was originally used as a method of calculation in public administration in ancient China. So it was a technology that existed. But the Chinese in, in developing this tech technology were unaware that they created an error. They, create, they created an error by virtue of the fact that this technology had commercial purposes that were not being deployed. And it was the utilization of double entry bookkeeping First, for example, in Northern Italy, amongst merchants and bankers that gave rise to the commercial revolution and economic growth that first took place in Western Europe. But this is an entrepreneurial act. Why is it an entrepreneurial act? Because there's existing technology, there's a technological innovation. Something that was given was repurposed for a completely different use that did not otherwise exist. Imagine a world in which, we would, in which we could productively specialize and exchange if we didn't have double entry bookkeeping. 
It's so fundamental to a market economy and calculating profits and losses that we take it for granted. We take for granted that it had to be discovered through entrepreneurship. Okay. So I've talked a little bit about the role of the entrepreneur and entrepreneurial thinking. But before I continue, I just wanted to see if there were any questions thus far about what I've said. Diego. Schumpeterian. Schumpeterian. For example, uh, going back to the example of oranges, like in a market, you can always see like different price ranges, right? Like somebody selling something for cheap and in another place they're selling it more expensive. But how does it contrast? Because for example, the people that yeah. are selling it for cheap are gonna have more consumers because the people that are buying are gonna see that they have an opportunity, right? To save money. Yeah. So then the other ones tend to lower the price because their competition has better prices. So nobody's gonna buy from them. So right. when does it like stop a disequilibrium stop getting into, into the pure scenario like group? Because there's always a tendency to equilibrate things, right? Right. But this is exactly what the role of the Kersnerian entrepreneur in, in acting as an arbitrageur, in arbitrating from buying at a low price and reselling at a high price because it creates, because when you sell at a high price, you increase in the supply of oranges where they were more scarce and it drives the price down. So what happens? Now entrepreneurs are realizing, wait a minute, the oranges are now more plentiful than they otherwise would be. So now they have to compete against each other by lowering the price. But someone has to, someone has to realize this beforehand. Right? We, ask, we also have the role of the entrepreneur has many important implications, particularly for under, how we're understanding also of how markets worked. Let me give, let me, let me explain what I mean by that. What entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurial market process illustrates to all of us is that markets are indeed imperfect. They are imperfect. But what do we mean by imperfect? Just from all of you, what are some synonyms? What are some, wor what are some wor other words that have the same meaning as imperfect that come to your mind? Well, like if there's a process that's imperfect, what do you think of? Not balanced is one. Anybody else? It's flawed, right? It's flawed. Inefficient. What are some others? Not ideal or suboptimal, okay? But this is all in comparison to an ideal of a perfect market, also known as perfect competition. A state of equilibrium where all profit opportunities are exhausted, right? So that's one meaning of imperfect. But the role of the entrepreneur illustrates an important, another important understanding of what it means for markets to be imperfect. Anybody here ha ever have any courses in Latin before? No Latin speakers here. If you look at the word imperfect and you divide it up, what we see that the, what the meaning of, of imperfect, tracing it back to its origins in Latin, gives us a radically different way from which to understand how markets work. If economic theory, the role of economic theory is to tell us a, a story about how markets work, but the assumptions that we build into our analysis will tell us different stories about whether markets fail or whether they work. 
So if we divide the word up into three parts, the first part of the word im comes from the Latin, the, neg the negation meaning not. Per comes from the Latin adverb thoroughly or thorough. And fect comes from the Latin verb facere, to do. So go and you can go and look this up in a dictionary. Another way to say that markets are imperfect implies that they are incomplete or not thoroughly done. They're in a process towards completion. Now, why is that important? If someone were to say to you, well, markets are imperfect and they, re they require correction. Well, that's the point. The role of the market process is to discover previously unnoticed profit opportunities. And this has very important implications, for example, with what is now going on in Guatemala today. So one of the big policy debates that is going on in Guatemala today is the need for antitrust policy, the regulation of monopolies, okay? Now, from the standpoint of perfect competition or perfectly competitive equilibrium, when we see monopoly power in a market, that exemplifies what economists refer to as a market failure, a deviation from perfect competition, a deviation from perfect competition. Now, in a world of perfect competition, what are we ruling out by definition? What are we ruling out by definition? The role of the entrepreneur, because in perfect competition, there are no profit opportunities. But if we are comparing an imperfect market with the ideal of perfect competition, and we forget the role of the entrepreneur, then a market that's stuck in an inefficient position is trapped in a situation in which what is the only solution to correct for that market? What's the only solution left? By logic. Government intervention. But note what I've just said. This is not an ideological point. This is a methodological point. It's a point about what assumptions we build into our analysis. I'm using the same word, but simply reframing the meaning gives us a radically different perspective on how markets work. Because if markets are entrepreneurial processes of discovery, which indeed are imperfect, what that implies is an inefficiency today, as you had pointed out, is what? A profit opportunity for the entrepreneur to, to monetize and correct that inefficiency in the future. An inefficiency today sets up a profit opportunity for correction in the future. Now, in what way do markets discipline monopoly power? Well, in the current context, particularly this is happening in the United States, there are renewed calls for antitrust regulation for platform economies. The Googles, the Airbnbs, right, the Facebooks of the world. Because it's regarded that these large firms, which have accumulated great concentrations of capital, erect barriers to entry that will preclude potential entrepreneurs from entering that market. And therefore, that provides a justification for government regulation, okay? Right, if, imagine for example, your name please. Carlos. Carlos, you wanted to go up, you wanted to set up and, and, and open a business and you wanted to compete against right, a much larger firm. Right, let's say you're Sam Walton, who founded Walmart. You want to compete against Sears. 
or JCPenney, who has lower borrowing costs? JCPenney or Sears or you do? Right? They do. They can borrow capital at a much lower cost. Because they are large firms and they have economies of scale, they can produce at a lower cost. How the hell can you compete against them? Right? Or even today, people will say, well, how can someone rival a company like Amazon? Jeff Bezos, for example. Right? This is a monopoly in, in, it, that's in need of regulation. But that story, you might say, puts the cart before the horse. What do I mean by it puts the, the, the story, it puts the cart before the horse? Let me give an example to illustrate the point I'm trying to make. Suppose, for example, what's your name? Emma. If I were to show you a picture of a horse, and that horse had all four hooves off the ground, would you conclude from that that horses fly? It's a, it's a ridiculous question, right? But what's the obvious answer? Horses don't fly. But why do you, but from looking at that picture, why would you conclude, even though the picture looks like it's flying, that they don't fly? Because it's, it's like that, like, I don't know, just horses don't fly. Yeah, it's a snapshot in time, right? It's just when the photo was taken at that moment of time, it looks like it's flying because all, the, but you know that horses don't fly because what do they do? They gallop, right? So when you understand the process of galloping, you understand how horses run. The same thing with markets. We could take a snapshot in time and see a firm is really big, right? And conclude, oh, it's a monopoly. But the more, that's not the, the more important question or the more relevant question is, how were they able to achieve that market share in the first place? That's a question about the process, not the outcome. The, the, the horse with all the four hooves off the ground, we're, we're looking at an outcome in time, not trying to understand how horses gallop. Same thing with markets. We have to understand how they work. So the question is, if indeed, let's just say for the sake of argument, an entrepreneur like Bezos has a great deal of market share, how was he able to do it? How was he able to obtain the capital to realize economies of scale? Was he born with that capital available to him? No. What institutional mechanism that economists may regard as a potential barrier to entry is the very source for the invitation of, industry, of, of, of entry and the erosion of monopoly power. Limited liability, right? What's limited liability, anyone here? Limited liability. For example, when Diego, if you buy a share of Microsoft, okay, suppose that Microsoft went bankrupt, how much are you going to lose? How much do you stand to lose? Everything you invested, right? Right. So if it was $100 a share and the stock went to zero, you lost $100. What about your house? or your car, or your other assets? No, right? Your liability is limited. But why do firms limit liability in the first place? What purpose does, that, does it serve? For any one single entrepreneur, the capital necessary to form an enterprise, it's, 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 it's a concentrated risk. Moreover, if you look at a company like Amazon or any large, large cap firm, the, the, the asset value is in the billions of dollars for any one single individual. That's a huge mon amount of money to put up. In fact, it may be difficult for any one single individual to put up. So what is the role of limited liability? To understand the importance of limited liability, we have to understand a situation in which it doesn't exist. Suppose, for example, Carlos, you were the investor of Microsoft, but we didn't have limited liability. And then 
at the first moment that you learn that they may be going bankrupt or insolvent, what would you do? You would sell because you don't want your personal assets to, right, to be seized. So what does limited, what role does limited liability do? It reduces the transaction costs of discovering potential investors of capital. In other words, capital ownership is not a prerequisite or a barrier to entry of markets. Rather, they are capital itself is realized through entrepreneurial discovery. Capital that it, investors want to put up for a new enterprise, they only make that available if entrepreneurs will sell them on a vision of how to allocate that capital from one use as opposed to another. What's the point I'm trying to make? Is that for any entrepreneur that regards large firms to be a stumbling block, always remember they started off somewhere, but how did they start off? They started off like any public trade, publicly traded company does through limited liability. So I talked about Sam Walton. He just, he started off just as a store clerk at JCPenney, if I'm not mistaken. We don't even see Sears in the United States anymore because he was able to realize through limited liability the capital necessary to establish a more efficient way to provide goods and services to human beings. So the point I'm trying to make is the entrepreneurial market process as an imperfect process sets up not only the potential for obtaining monopoly power, but it's also the very source of eliminating monopoly power itself. Precisely because the entrepreneurial market process is dependent on frictions and errors and imperfections because those very imperfections is what gives rise to profit opportunities. But those profit opportunities are contingent upon institutional arrangements that create invitations to entry, not barriers to entry. Diego, go ahead. Well, let's say, for example, in Guatemala, yeah. competing against a monopoly like Cemental Progreso, let's say, I don't know if you're familiar. I, I've, I actually learned about it this week. Yeah, so how can you use limited li liability to compete against monsters like Cemental Progreso or, or Cervecería or like firms like that? Let's say you wanted to start a business here and you want to grow, but they have all the market here for that. Is it a, let me ask you this, are they a protected industry? Are they, uh, do they have any protection from the government? Or, or have they been able to realize that market share simply by being efficient? That's the first, I, I don't know the answer, that's the first question you have to ask. The first question you have to ask is, have they been able to realize that scale and market share through efficient production? If they have, then that implies that they're making the consumers better off. But that itself doesn't necessarily imply they're charging a monopoly price. So being, you might say, the fact that a particular um, market is defined maybe by one or two competitors does not necessarily mean that it is monopolistic in terms of the price that they're charging. It's, it's possible, right? But let me, give, let me give an example to illustrate what was the name of the company that you talked about? What's their, do you know what their market cap is? Like how much they're valued? 84%. That's their market share today. Wow, okay. But what's the value of the company? Do you, do you know? Roughly, is it in the billions or millions of dollars? Yeah. Something like that, I don't know exactly, but we can look it up. Yep. But let me give, let me give an example of 
a, a, a company in the US that was considered un, unbeatable. I don't know how many here, uh, does anyone here own a camera? I'm not talking about the one on your phone, but just like individual cameras, right? Not anymore. Have you heard of the company Kodak? Why do you know about Kodak? I mean, what do they sell here? Disposable cameras, right? Back in, anyone here heard of a Kodak moment? This expression? Right. A Kodak moment was literally, this was a, a, a commercial uh, phrase that, that Kodak would use. It's like, get your Kodak moment. Meaning when you take a photo, that's called a Kodak moment. They literally monopolized the idea of taking a photo. That's how much market share they had in the 80s. But what was an, um, an entrepreneurial profit opportunity that they missed out on, on digital film? Because of the rise of digital film, their market share has literally plummeted in the United States. So another competitor came to the fore by simply exposing what had been an error in Kodak's decision-making. They could have gotten into the business of digital film, but they did not. They continued to make right, regular film. And because of that, they got clobbered in the market. Okay, so. But with the question about the, the cement company, I would have to know the details. Right? It could be that they have such large market share because they have government protection. I don't know. But if they have that market share because they're able to realize economies of scale, that does not necessarily imply that they're charging monopoly prices. Not necessarily. Um, but I'm happy to talk about that uh, afterwards. We're about out of time, right? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your attention.